God's already promised his kingdom is coming, but we have to choose to do exactly what he's asking us to do, to give up everything. Most of the highest mountains in the world is where the Tibetan people are. To be Tibetan is to be Tibetan Buddhist. And the only way not to suffer is to not exist. There's no security, no way to be sure what's going to happen. Four months after we came, the house started shaking. At the time of the earthquake, one village had been completely covered. Almost every single person from this people group was dead. And I was reminded at that point of God's promise that someone from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation will be at the foot of Jesus. We have a team from our home church joining us on this journey, demonstrate our love, just helping them rebuild their houses. God is using that earthquake to start fresh spiritually with a relationship with Christ. So don't waste those opportunities. Use it for what God has for us to do. When the world needed rescued, love entered the scene. The arms that hung the stars bound in swaddling cloth. Those same stars hung in the night when angels broke out in song. This love, compelling enough to cause shepherds to leave sheep. This love, powerful enough to threaten insecure kings. This love, wide enough to embrace anxious parents. And in a world where grace seems to be in remission, this love propels you on his mission. It seems the whole world showed up to get a glimpse of love, voiced in a baby's cry. And that love is what they're still pursuing. But we settled for being right, one retweet at a time. A divided nation needs a united church. Pulsating with a love so unreal, people can't help but ask, what's the catch? No catch, just a seat at the table, someone to mourn alongside the outcast. Because when we love the outsider, we get a better glimpse at the family in the manger. This Christmas, may his love be on your list, and then may you pass it on, for love is falling like snow in a globe. And because Jesus came, I have love. Please pray, Please pray with me. Father God, uh, we thank you so much for allowing us to gather here today, Lord, to worship and to praise your holy name, Father. Uh, God, as we enter this Christmas season. Father, I know that so many people, including myself, will, will love more, uh, who give more, and it's always on our mind. Father God, I just pray that, that you will show us how to love, Father, as, as you first loved us. God, because love is patient, love is kind, love shows no bounds, Father. No matter the, the race, the religion, the background, Father, I pray, Father, that we can love one another as you first loved us, God, outside of these four walls. God, that it, it, this, in a nation, and told as it is, Father, that we, we need more love. God, and God, I just thank you for, for convicting me of that. I know that you've been dealing with me uh, in, in that aspect, Father, just to love more than, I, than myself, Father. And God, today, I just pray that we'll just lay it all out there in front of your feet, every doubt, Father, every, um, everything that's going on in our lives, God, that we would just lay it all at your feet, Father, and just let you have it. Father, as we continue in our worship service, I pray, God, that uh, you would prepare our hearts and our minds, Father, so that we can truly worship you, Father, in the way that it's intended to be, Father. No holding back. God, thank you for all that you've done for us, and speak through Dr. Hanks in a mighty way, God, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 And let me welcome you this morning to the first Sunday in December, the second Sunday of Advent. Last week, we lit the candle of hope. And this morning, uh, our, one of our deacons, Justin, uh, lit the candle of love. Christmas celebrates the reality, the truth that love came down. 
Love is an act of God rooted in the very heart of God. And so when we tell the story of Christmas, we tell the story of love. And we're going to tell the love story of Christmas a little bit different uh, this morning. You're going to hear some very familiar Christmas songs, very familiar Christmas hymns. But we're also going to sing some other songs that aren't uh, immediately identifiable with Christmas, but they have the message of Christmas at their very core. Because for God to love meant that God gave abundantly, richly, transformationally, and that love turns us into givers. And so this is a special Sunday. This is our Prove This Tithe Sunday, and we've been challenging our church members uh, to give generously and to commit and, and plan to give generously in the coming year. But giving and Christmas go intimately together. That's the story of Christmas. So let me share the Christmas story from the first letter that John wrote to the church, 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Now, y'all know I've been working on my, my scripture memory, so I'm going to try to do it from memory, but this is the Christmas story, and the Christmas story is bound up in, these, in this passage. It may not be the first passage you think of when you think of Christmas, but it is John's telling of the truth of Christmas in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in God and he in us, because God has given us of his spirit. We have seen and we testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That's 1 John 4, verses 7 through 14, and that is the Christmas story God gave to us. He's given us one another to love one another, and through that we proclaim that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. I'll be talking more in my message about the call to give, and I want to remind you there's some opportunities uh, in, in our life together to give. Uh, again, I want to welcome you guests. We're especially glad that you're here today. And you may be here this morning uh, because you uh, were a part of our Breakfast with Santa event yesterday. And I'm so glad that you've uh, taken an opportunity to, to join us this morning as our guest. Now, i got to tell you, because I knew we'd have some guests this morning, and I knew that there would be an emphasis on giving. And I always feel a little bit of heartburn. We've got all these guests, and I'm going to talk about giving. But I'm glad you're here on this Sunday. Because we give, if you're a guest, we give because we're waiting for you and we love you. We want you to have a building and a seat. We want you to have, uh, uh, I was going to say heating, but we don't do heating uh, in December, <laughs> apparently in Baldwin County, so we've got the air conditioner on, I'm sure. But, but places for your children and things for you to do and, and, and Christmas celebrations because we love you. And it's a joy for us, for, for you to watch us love Jesus by giving because we love him and we love you and we're glad to give as a result. Also, you can celebrate this morning. Uh, uh, after the worship service is over, we have lunch to go. We'll provide lunch for you. You can pick it up, and that supports and benefits our children's ministry. Also, uh, a great exemplar of love is uh, going to be tonight. We're going to celebrate the life and, and ministry uh, and service of, of Pastor Bubba Sawyer as he enters into his retirement. Six o'clock, we're going to have time of worship. Then afterwards, we'll be in the fellowship hall to have a reception and, uh, and some food and, and, and fellowship together. You're not going to want to miss that. Bubba was a tremendous giver in our life together, and we look forward to celebrating him as he steps into this new chapter in his life. But the Christmas story is the call to give as we have been given. 
And so the song that the quartet is about to share is not a song that jumps to your mind for Christmas, but it's the very heart of what Christmas is all about. You let this song light your fire this morning as we worship together. If you want more happy than your heart will hold If you want to stand taller if the truth were told Take whatever you have and give it away If you want less lonely and a lot more fun And deep satisfaction when the day is done Throw your heart wide open and give it away in his garden when I happened by He waved me over with that look in his eye And started breaking off some ear of corn Here boy, today this corn is just right Boil it up for your supper tonight I've learned it's true what my pappy used to say Nothing's quite as good until you give it away. If you want more happy than your heart will hold, if you want to stand taller if the truth were told, take whatever you have and give it away. If you want less lonely and a lot more fun, Satisfaction when the day is done Throw your heart wide open And give it away There are two kinds of folks Takers and givers Strikers and complainers And big-hearted livers It depends on how we choose To live our days Nothing's quite as good Until we give it all Stand taller if the truth were told. Take whatever you have and give it away. Give, 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 give it away. Want less lonely and a lot more fun and deep satisfaction when the day is done. Throw your heart wide open and give it away. Yeah. When the day is done, throw your heart wide open and give it a give, 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 give it away. Oh, more happy than your heart will hold. If you want to stand taller, if 
if the truth were told, take whatever you have. Give it away. You give it away. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Well, good morning again. And what, how am I following that, John? John said, you're going to follow us. Are you kidding me? Um, but man, how awesome it is. And then to watch these men who love Jesus with all their heart be able to sing and, and just pour out, right? And be able to give back the talents that they have been given. And um, Will Scott right here on the end with the cowboy boots. Matter of fact, I want a pair of cowboy boots for Christmas. <laughs> I'm just going to let you know that. Um, man, we've been praying for him. He's been rescued, right? God has cured him of cancer. So, you know, why do people get excited when they sing? They've been rescued. Amen? So if you're wondering why sometimes people say, what is he so excited about? Well, whenever your life is spared, whenever you give your heart to Jesus, you get excited. And you have something to sing about. You have something to get excited about. So this morning, uh, we're going to do that with the decorations all up. Why? How can we not sing a Christmas song? So we're going to sing a Christmas song uh, this morning. All of you know, uh, just curious, has anybody done with their Christmas shopping? Has anybody started? Okay, well, this song will help you get in the spirit for Christmas shopping. But in Psalm 126, it says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter then, and our tongues with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, quote, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we were joyful. So this morning, we come with a joyful heart ready to celebrate and give God what he deserves this morning to praise him and worship him. So let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing a very familiar song. I'm about to be maybe a little different. Maybe.
him Lord of all. But it began on a holy night. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of a dear Savior's birth. Come, lay the world in sin and error hiding till he
Please be seated, and as you're being seated, let me lead us in prayer. Father, it is good to come into your house this morning and ascribe, as the song just said, ascribe to you all majesty. Well, we confess to you that in the days between our last gathering of worship and this one, we have been tempted and even have succumbed to the temptation to lift our souls to something other than you for hope and help and security. And God, we come into this place and we're healed by the worshipful call to direct our hearts to the only source of our hope, help, and healing. In this season, oh God, as we Focus our attention especially on the gift of Christ to us. Coming from the glories of heaven willingly into the broken, dark, dirty world to rescue us. Oh God, would you let your rescuing love transform us, change the way we think about everything. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And if you would open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. I've already quoted this passage of Scripture to you, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. I do not think I bungled it too badly. Of course, how would I know I wasn't looking at anything? So, But we're going to walk through this text together, this different kind of Christmas story that gives us a different kind of call. But I want you to do something, if you would. This will be a little bit different. In the pew rack in front of you, there's a little blue card. And it is a commitment card by which you will be able to make a commitment this morning concerning your giving. Now, you may not be ready to make that commitment That's uh, this morning. That's completely fine. You'll notice there isn't a place to sign or put your name. We don't want you to do that. We just want you to share with us, uh, as God prompts you, uh, some of your plans about your tithes and offerings and, and how you plan to give in the coming year. I always find that when I'm uh, asked to think real specifically about a particular matter of importance, I just do better. And so that's a, uh, this is just a tool this morning. And at the end of our worship service, before you, you leave uh, to head to uh, your Bible study time, we're going to ask you, instead of going directly out the back, if the Lord has led you this morning and, and you're ready, you can come to one of these baskets, come down the aisle, and then, and then head on uh, to, to what God calls you to next. But you can come and, uh, and share that gift with us. <clears throat> and here's what you're doing, just so you're not confused. We're, we're talking this morning about what the Lord is prompting you about in terms of giving in addition to what you gave this year. So you'll be sharing with us, uh, if you've been faithful with your tithe, uh, God's also called us to bring a tithe and an offering to his storehouse. We focus on that. Last, last week from Malachi 3, God says, don't rob me. Instead, bring uh, to me uh, the whole tithe. Uh, bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse. So I'm prepared to give. I've got my, my tithe and my commitment card ready to go. Uh, and so the other thing we're doing is proving the tithe. I hope you'll, usually I give online. But uh, I'm going to uh, give in the worship service uh, this morning along with you. And we're going to get a picture in December of what things would look like uh, if we were faithful across the board as a church to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. I think we're going to see something special uh, in this area of generosity in our lives. But the reason I'm starting my sermon this way is because what I want you to do is have a very, very, very tangible, practical application to what you hear this morning, because that's what it means to love one another. That's what it means to love one another. This call and that word agape, it's not a general love. It's not, a, it's not an idea of love. It's not uh, some sort of broad commitment to try to be a nicer person in the world. But when the Bible speaks of loving one another as God has loved us, when the Bible speaks of loving one another as Christ has rescued and loved us, when God speaks of loving one another because the Spirit abides in us, that is, a, that is a, an enormously specific and practical love. That's why John goes on to say, don't just love, but love who? 
Love one another. The, the way we learn to live in love is to love the people that are right next to us. The great mistake of many of our attempts at love, again, is that they're sort of disconnected and disembodied. Well, it's easy to love anybody. It's hard to love that knucklehead sitting next to you, right? I was reading uh, some G.K. Chesterton recently, and he has a a book that's that's um, on the nature of unbelief. And I ran across this quote that so captures what God is talking about, uh, what John is talking about when we're called to love one another. Here's what Chesterton says. He says, we make our friends and we make our enemies, but God makes our next door neighbor. Hence, he comes to us clad in all the careless terrors of nature. He is as strange as the stars, as reckless and indifferent as the rain. He is man, the most terrible of the beasts. That is why the old religion and the old scriptural language showed so sharp a wisdom when they spoke, not of one's duty towards humanity, but one's duty towards one's neighbor. It's easy to love anybody. It's even easy to love everybody, but it's hard to love a real live person who's just like you with all of his strengths and weaknesses and highs and lows, the things about him that are good and bad, all those things about uh, himself or herself that they don't recognize or problematic or annoying. And so we're called to love one another as a specific application of God's call in our lives to put his salvific work in us into practical, real-time, world-changing application. And as we learn to love one another, that love grows, that circle of one another's begins to grow until it spills out of our life together and into our community and beyond until God uses our loving one another to throw his arms around the whole world. That's why this passage begins with the command to love one another and it ends with the proclamation and the confession that we make because we know it that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus says it like this in the Upper Room Discourse. They will know by our love for one another that the world may know that God has sent His Son by how you love the people in this room. And that's why we give, because it's a great, practical, specific demonstration of our love for one another. You see, I don't think we're going to reach fair hope by being the coolest. I don't think we're going to reach fair hope by being the hippest. I don't think we're going to reach fair hope by being the most relevant. I think we're going to reach fair hope by loving one another. As we've never known it before. And I want to tell you, this is a loving church. And I appreciate it. I've been well loved by you. I'm blown away by your love for one another. Our community is seeing our love for them. We had hundreds of little young families walk in and out of this place yesterday just receiving the love that comes from the Lord, hearing the Christmas story and seeing the gospel. But what would happen if we just continued to step ever more deeply into this call to radically love one another? to learn how to do it specifically, to learn how to do it especially when it's difficult. Well, this is the call of God in our lives. Beloved, let us love one another. Here's a good definition of love. Now, remember, when the Bible uses love, it uses the word agape, and that's sort of a different kind of thing going on when the writers use agape, and John is the is the disciple of love. He's known as the beloved disciple. A third of the times that the word love is mentioned in the New Testament, fully one-third of all the instances of love. And do you think the New Testament mentions love regularly? Yes, it does. But of the 264 times that the word love is used in the New Testament, a third of those are used by John in his gospel, in these three letters, and in the book of Revelation. John had been overwhelmed. He had collided with the love of God in Christ Jesus through the power of the Spirit, and he just couldn't quit talking about it and thinking about it. Something I discovered as well is uh, the book of Ephesians 
is the book where Paul most frequently speaks of love. And it's likely that Ephesus is where John went after the church began to be persecuted. And I think uh, John was already working in that city uh, when when Paul arrived there. And and there was a mutual interpenetrating of a focus on the love of God. Paul doesn't talk about love as much as John does. But when Paul talks about it, it's always at a critical fulcrum point in his letters. Because Paul had a collision with love changed everything and so here's what's going on there are four words for love in koine greek in the first century there's storge and that speaks of family love uh, there's uh, uh, phileo which speaks of of brotherly love the, the love of the people that we storge speaks of the love of the people we don't get to choose our family phileo speaks of the love we do get to choose our friends Eros speaks of romantic love that kind of wanting sort of love and then finally the fourth love is agape was very infrequently used in the first century. Sort of by a non-Christian might have meant sort of a beneficence or sort of someone with a, with a whole lot that, that might deign to give to someone lesser. But it's precisely because the word was so little used that the first Christians took that word and redefined it in terms of God. And here's what I want you to catch. For John... And for the writers of the New Testament, love isn't an idea. Love is simply the word that you put on what God did in Christ on the cross. That's what love is. Love equals the gospel. Love equals what God does in Jesus for you. That's what love is. That's what fills it up and gives it its content. That's why uh, we're going to learn, first of all, that love one another flows from the Father. If you're going to love one another, it's because you've been transformed by a supernatural relationship with God. You will never love. And you may be thinking right now, I could never love the people in this church. (laughs) I could never love uh, the people around me. They're so annoying and they're so irritating and they make so many mistakes and they won't do what I want them to do. You'll never love. With a God-ordained, agape kind of love until you're in a relationship with God. Love is deeply, fundamentally rooted in the reality of a relational God. And that's why John says, God is love. And then here's the hard-hitting word. The one who does not love, what does it say? Doesn't know God. In fact, in chapter 3, John will say, if you say you love God but you hate your brother, you're a a liar. The truth of God, the light of God is not in your life. And so for some of you this morning who think, why would I give? Are you kidding? I'm not going to give. Look at all the things the church does wrong. Look at all the mistakes they've made. Look at who's in charge up there. I ain't giving to that. I get it. I get it. I have a mean streak and a selfish streak in me a mile wide, and only the constant activity of a loving God in my life makes me any different. God is love. It is the nature of his Trinitarian life. We're going to celebrate, and we meet God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit in this text. And here's what I want you to catch about that. That when the Bible says God is love and then the Bible calls us to love one another, we're to love one another the way the Father and the Son and the Spirit love each other. Now, how well do you think the Father and the Son and the Spirit love each other? Perfect. That's why the Bible talks about perfect love. It's perfection. Eternally giving. Eternally receiving. Eternally laying their lives down for one another and receiving it. And it's that eternal love of God, eternal relationality of God that made creation possible and that makes new creation possible. And so it's only in fellowship with the Father. And it is very specific. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Father. The Son loves the Spirit. The Father loves the Spirit. They love one another in a specific kind of way. That's how it shows up. And that kind of love changes everything. It is supernatural. It's lavish. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, 
What manner of love the Father has given us. What, and, and the word there is lavish. Behold how God has lavished his love on us. And what's the result of that? Do you remember from John chapter 3? We become children of God as a result of that. And so if you're going to give this morning, if you're going to fill out one of these little blue cards, or you're going to begin to listen to the Lord's leading about how you should give in order to love one another, it starts in it with a relationship with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. If you don't love this morning, if you feel cynical and bitter, feel like you've been wronged, feel like you have a right to just sort of sit on the sidelines of the call to love radically, it's because you don't know God. And that's where things need to change. You see, we're not calling anybody to give anything. We're calling people to receive and respond. Love one another flows from the Father. Here's a good definition of this agape love. You may want to even write this down. It is a generous, sacrificial endeavor for another person's redemption, regardless of their worth or their ability to pay. Let me say it one more time. It's a generous, not how little can I give, but how much can I give. It is sacrificial. That means it's going to cost you something. You don't give out of the leftover. You give out of the essence of who you are. It's an endeavor. It's not a nice thought. It's not a warm feeling. It's not a hope or a wish, but it is an action, a journey that you choose to go on with someone for another person's redemption. Love says, I want God's best for you. That's why it's full of the truth. That's why it's not just tolerance of of someone's sick and sinful and selfish behavior, but it's a, a love that has the courage to tell the truth, the courage to go the distance, the courage to call forth redemption, regardless of their worth. They don't deserve it. And regardless of their ability to pay you back. In fact, Jesus says, look for those especially who can't pay you back. Those are the best kind of people to love is those who can't pay you back. In fact, the best, best, best kind of person to love is who? Your enemy. The hardest person to love is the place you ought to start because that shows forth what is certainly and completely divine. Love one another flows from the Father. Secondly, love one another is shaped by the Son. This love was manifested in us. How? God sent his only begotten son, his unique, one-of-a-kind, uniquely related son into the world that you might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as our propitiation. There's your big, heavy theological word for the day. A hilasmon is the, is the word. And it, it, it speaks of that sacrifice that's made to avert the rightful wrath of God. By our rebellion and our rejection of God's love, our hatred of God, we have thrown up a barrier between us and God. We've dug a chasm that we cannot cross. And the consequences of that have to be dealt with. And Jesus, the sinless Son of God, willingly absorbed the payload of that sin debt in himself so that you could have a way to the Father. And probably more accurately, that the Father had a way to you. And then here's the thing that ought to blow your mind. Beloved, as he has loved you, so loved you, so you also ought to what? Love him back. See, I'd like that deal. That would, that would make sense to me. He loved God, loved me so much. I'm going to love him. I'm going to come into church and sing beautiful songs and, 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 and say wonderful things and quote scripture. Radical, divine thing that God says is, I'm, I want you to love me. Of course, we're, we're called, we're, we're created to, to, to love and know God. But the powerful display of that love, it's, this, it's the same side, it's two sides of the same coin. To love God is to love one another. They're the same thing. When Jesus is asked, what's most important? What's the most important thing about following God? Love God. Love your neighbor. Love the person right there next to you. It's the whole thing. And it has a cross shape, Christ shape to it. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. 
goes on to say, I think it's so cool that there's a 1 John 3.16. Did you know that? Read 1 John 3.16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for him? No. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Jesus washes the the feet of his disciples, and he says, just as you've seen me do this for you, you do this for each other. Jesus says, I don't need you to wash my feet. Two of those feet belong to who? That's agape love. That's agape love. And that kind of love changes everything. I was listening to a podcast last week, and a a professor at a Christian college uh, had a young, probably freshman level kid who was a doubter and a cynic. And, and at the end of one of his lectures, he said, oh, this Jesus stuff is just a, just a, uh, it's, 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 it's a bunch of junk. It just doesn't work anymore. It's so irrelevant. And the professor says, well, before you settle on that conclusion, I want you to do this between now and the next time we gather together. I think it was four or five days. He said, I want you to treat every person you meet as though they were Jesus Christ. Treat every person you meet to the best of your abilities as though they were Jesus Christ. You think you can do that? And the guy said, sure. So he went home and because he he just a kid who commuted to school, lived at home. His mom walked in, started doing the dishes, and he thought, you know, if that were Jesus, I would probably want to come alongside and serve and help him. So he he said, Mom, why don't you let me do the dishes? Dad came in and and, uh, the boy thought, you know, usually he just walks in, I go to my room and he goes to his, but instead, I'm going to, if it was Jesus, I'd want to know what was going on with him. So he sat down and said, Dad, tell me, tell me about your day. What's going on? One of his siblings came in, and helped him out with his homework, and helped him out with some chores, because that's what he would have done. That's what Jesus would have done for him. And this went on for several more days. The young man came into class the next time around and said, my life has been completely changed by something I never expected. The power of love has changed everything, and it isn't a love that comes from me. It's a love that comes from Christ. It changes everything. That's what loving one another looks like. Not when it's easy. Oh, here's the mistake that we make in church, is that the job of the church and the job of the people around you is to make it easy for you to love them. That is just not how it works. We love them precisely because they are hard to love. We come into church and we say, it has to be exactly what I want or I'm not going to be too happy about it. It, You're not here to get what you want. You're not here to get, period. You're here to give. And so is everybody else. And then a miracle occurs. I love telling this story. A, a rabbi was asked, what, is, what does heaven look like and hell look like? And the rabbi says, well, let me, let me tell you a story. A man went down to, to hell, first of all, and a door opened. And he looked into this room, this great banqueting hall, delicious food everywhere at, at every seat. But every person sitting at the table was like a skeleton, emaciated, just skin and bones. They each had a really long spoon. The spoon was too long, and they would dip into the food, but they couldn't, they couldn't angle it around to get in their mouths, and so they had nothing to eat day after day, month after month, year after year, until they were starving to death forever. He says, then I went over to the door, marked heaven, opened it up, and it was exactly the same scene. Big banqueting table, food everywhere, but instead of the people being emaciated and skeletal, they were plump and laughing and joyful, had those same long spoons, but they were feeding one another, feeding one another. And everybody had plenty to eat. See, when we're worried, we might not get what we want. Everything gets off the tracks. But when everybody is putting the needs of others ahead of their own, everybody gets what they want. And all of the kingdom of God thrown in and on top of it. That's how it works. Give to the uttermost. Prefer others ahead of yourself. And watch how they prefer you to themselves. That's a love that will transform a church, a city, and a world. Love one another is shaped by the sun. That's how Jesus loved you. And then finally, love one another is the work of the Spirit. Love one another is the work of the Spirit. 
We're told that nobody has seen God at any time, but we can see the movement of the Spirit. Just like the wind blows, Jesus says, you can, you can see where it goes. You don't know where it comes from. You can't see wind, but you can see its effect. And what John says here is, is that the, the work of the Spirit that calls forth the proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God, the proclamation that the Father has sent the Son, that's what the Spirit's work is in us. And our best and most complete work of love is to share the love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the evidence of the Spirit, by the way. It's not getting emotional in a worship service. It's not getting... Uh, Goosebumps, all those things are wonderful things. I got goosebumps this morning while I was singing with, with you all. But the evidence of the Spirit is that we love one another and that that love has the characteristic of making Jesus known. It's, not again, just a general kind of niceness, but it's a Christ-centered proclamation that names the name of Jesus and confesses him as Lord. It is a love that abides in us. It's a love that's perfected in us. It does a sanctifying work in us. We look more and more, by the work of the Spirit, we look more and more and more like Christ. I love this confession. It, it casts out fear. Look at chapter 1, sorry, chapter 4, verse 7, beginning in verse 17. By this, love is perfected within us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in the world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear. Fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. I'm going to make y'all a promise. This is going to be my theme verse for 2022. Perfect love casts out fear. I spent so much of my life being afraid. And too much of, of it being afraid of the church as I pastor. Don't want to get hurt. Don't want something bad to happen to me. Don't want to be made to look bad. And that's not loving to you. That's loving me more than you. Here's what I'm going to work to do. And it takes all of my energy. I spent some time this week. Oh, <laughs> so I'm memorizing the verse, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my scripture memory while I drive. It's probably dangerous to do, but, but that's what I was doing. I'm doing my scripture memory while I'm driving. And so, so, I'm, uh, so I'm coming down Greeno and I'm going to take the little peel off that, that goes downtown, you know, t- towards downtown. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know the names of any of the roads, but, but the one with the American flags on it. Y'all got it? So, so, and here's what happens is you're on Greeno, we're going one speed, and then you pull off of that and go on another speed, a speed that I like less than the speed uh, on Greeno. So I'm like, so I'm like uh, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Hey, man, speed up! Wow. <laughs> While I'm quoting the scripture on love, I'm yelling at the guy in front of me. It's got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of work to do. But here's the deal. Loving like Christ loved us will take almost all of the energy that you have. You won't have really any, any energy left over to criticize others or complain or gripe about this or that. It takes almost all of my energy to make space in my spirit for the spirit of God to be made manifest. And when that happens, something supernatural begins to occur. And we do confess that The Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And the reach of our one another goes further and further and further. Want to just see a picture this morning, Sharon? Can you put that up? It's a picture I got yesterday. Just got this from Ron Mitchell. Many of you know Ron Mitchell. He's one of our great church members, deacon, that loves missions. He got this picture yesterday, and many of you remember Daniel and Ruth. They're missionaries. They're not missionaries. They're a pastor and pastor's wife in Brazil. We do a lot of mission work in Brazil, and they're a pastoral team and a church team that we do a lot of work with in Brazil. Well, another mission partner that they have is Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child. And so those are the little Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes that are in their laps. Now, they're not the ones that, that we packed. Ours are still on the way. But believers in the United States somewhere, because they love Jesus and they love one another, gave in such a way that not children in general, not all boys and girls everywhere, but those boys and girls, the little ones you see right up there on that screen, have the only gift they're going to get. They're all from a favela, if I'm saying that right, a favela, a really tough neighborhood in Brazil. And that's the only present they're going to get. 
and included in it is the gospel and gospel proclamation and the opportunity to be discipled and to see their homes and families, parents transformed and the love of God in Christ for one another reaches all the way to Brazil and even further than that because that's what the Spirit makes possible when we love one another. So here's the question. Will you let God's love for you turn you into a person who loves the other sacrificially, generously, transformationally? Would you bow your heads with me? A love one another kind of life begins with an encounter with the one true and living God. When we say agape, we don't, we don't have some idea of God as this disinterested force in the universe. But it's deeply personal, one-on-one and relational. And if you don't have a personal relationship with God through his son Jesus, that can begin today. I understand if you hear about giving and don't have any interest in it. I didn't either until Jesus came and started changing me. So we're going to stand in a moment and we're going to sing. Pastors will be down here in the front. And you may just need to come and say, I don't love anybody. Not enough to give. And I'm alarmed at the state of my soul. And I need to be changed. When you have a collision with Jesus and his love. Everything changes. Others of you, you're searching for a church home, praying about where God would have you, and I want you to know we are not perfect, but we are endeavoring to love one another as never before, and we will love you in Christ Jesus, and we'll call you to love us as we love God, others in the world together. You can take a step this morning to making this church your home. Others of you, There's just another level of obedience that God's calling you to. There's another level of grace and generosity and service in your time and your talents and your treasure. And even as you hold this little card in your hand, it has the word more on it. It's God calling you to more in your fellowship with him and in your heart for the one another's. Oh God, I pray that you would flood this place with your love by flooding this place with love for one another. Do it in such a way that soon all of our city will be compelled to remark all those people love each other. There's not a single need unmet. There's not a single hunger that isn't filled. Or would you call us into your love relationship and then would you use us to share that love. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? This hymn of invitation is for you. And as you stand and as you sing, the pastors are coming forward. If you need to make a decision this morning, you come as we sing. All to Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him my free Trust Him in His presence daily live. And I surrender all. And I surrender all. And all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. 
your heads with me. Ryan's just going to play for another moment or two. In a moment or two, we're going to pause the, the invitation so that I can share some decisions with you. But I'm wondering if you would say yes to the invitation to let God's love loose in you. I only want you to do what the Holy Spirit guides you to do. I only want you to do what flows from the love of God into your life. Some of you may need to do more thinking about that. What is God calling you to do with his love? In the quietness of this moment, would you let the Father speak to you through the Son? by the Spirit. Father, I thank you for moving in us today. I thank you for your agape love in my life. Stir us to fresh obedience, sacrificial availability, redemptive passion, because we believe the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, would you be seated? Let me share some things with you. Don't want you to miss out on any of this. And so first of all, Lexi, Lindsay, would you come stand with me here? And you can stand right here on the right side of me. Many of you know Lexi. She's grown up in, in our church, grown up in the great ministries here, has had a special connection for years with our children's ministry and has sort of come up uh, under uh, uh, Pastor Kevin's ministry and leadership, and she's continued to step up in leadership uh, in that area of our church. And God has used that service uh, in our children's ministry to stir in Lexi a call to ministry. And so she is saying yes to God's call and ministry over her life. Amen. Amen. She feels a special call to, uh, to children's ministry, and so she'll, she's still working through what, a, what the educational process for that's going to look like, a, a seminary and that sort of thing. But she wanted to stake the claim uh, of, of, uh, before her church family that this is, uh, this is the call of God on her life. Uh, she's looking forward, kind of talking about possibly Mississippi College uh, as, a, as, a, as a Baptist college uh, where um, my daughter went uh, and is in ministry this morning. Uh, and... and um, excited about what all those next chapters look like. But church, if you sense the Holy Spirit drawing this sweet young lady uh, to take this step of faith and to go out from us uh, in mission and ministry, would you say amen? Amen. 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 And if you'll just stay right here, don't move. And then the Moy family, y'all come stand with me here. In fact, if you'll just stand next to Lexi, this is Hunter and Stephanie and Rebecca and David. And they come this morning. We got a chance to visit a little bit uh, on Wednesday night. They've been coming for a while. They're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, uh, even David, we're talking about baptism and, and all that good stuff. Uh, uh, that was through Vacation Bible School. And so thankful for the children's ministry uh, of our church. Really uh, helped the boys connect with us along with all the other ministries of our church. But they love Jesus. Uh, they sense God's call to place their lives here, coming on the promise of a letter from a sister church. Uh, and they're staking their claim that uh, we're going to love one another in this place and serve Jesus together. So, church, if you sense the Holy Spirit leading this family to be a part of our life together, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Well, if you all would be seated, you too, yes, yeah, very good, you're, you're just, Lexi's good at following orders that don't make any sense, so. 
do want to give you a chance. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, oh, and before, let me, uh, let me give you one more encouragement and reminder about our special time tonight, Sharon. If you want to uh, show them this little encouraging video, and then I'll remind you of something real quick. not going to want to miss out on this time of celebration and testimony. Uh, uh, Bubba Sawyer uh, served, uh, grew up in Fairhope, uh, served here uh, on, a, on a number of occasions uh, as a, a minister in various roles. I uh, served on the other side of the world in Mauritius as a missionary, uh, different states, as a youth minister, a, a, a education a pastor. And God has used him tremendously across the years. And we're just going to give uh, glory to God for that uh, tonight at 6. It'll be a great time together. You'll be encouraged, and then we'll get to celebrate together uh, with some fellowship. So don't miss out on any of, any of that. I know you're going to want to be here. And then I've already already prayed through uh, what my gift is going to be. So that's, that's uh, my, my tithe and my, my commitment card. Right. Where's my commitment card? Here it is. And so I'm going to lead us in prayer. Uh, we'll have some uh, music playing. Can we have some music playing? It's Thank you, Karen. And um, if you need to take another moment or two, you can. When I, when I con conclude and pray, I'm going to ask the folks who made decisions today if they just come stand right here. I know you're going to want to come by and greet them and, and uh, welcome them and hug Lexi's neck and all that good stuff. We want you to get a chance to do, do, to do that. But also these baskets are here for you as well. And if you're ready to bring your tithe or to, uh, to, to make your commitment today, uh, you can place those in the basket before you leave. And, um, and we'll, uh, we'll watch what God does uh, as he prompts us in this area and gets us ready uh, uh, to celebrate Christmas. It's been good to be with you this morning, getting ready for the Christmas season. Well, let me lead us in prayer, the prayer of dedication over this time of giving together. Families and, and Lexi, I want you, Moise and Lexi, y'all go ahead and come on. And if you, if you would, just stand right here. Everyone else, join me in prayer. God, we love you, and we, we just thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the time of worship. We thank you for the incredible song about giving it away. Uh, Lord, we're, we're thankful for the gift uh, you've given us in, in music and, and the chance to, to sing back to you all that's worthy of you. And now, Lord, I pray that you would direct our hearts, each and every believer in this place. In the quietness of this moment, we would hear from you. You've loved us so well. And you've made it crystal clear that the effect of that love is loving one another and the nature of that love is a generous, sacrificial endeavor and the evidence of that love is all around us and beautiful places and spaces for families and children to come and ministry that reaches out even to places as far away as Brazil and beyond. We want to be obedient today and we want you to be glorified. Thank you for the gift of the Moy family. I pray that you would use them to strengthen us and that we would be good brothers and sisters in Christ to them and the family of God as they grow in their love for you, for one another, and for the work of the kingdom. Lord, I thank you for Lexi. What a, what a beautiful picture of, of, of what the scripture verse is about. God, here is my life. Take it and use it. Lord, we pray that you would do mighty things and her life and ministry as you lead her forward to all that you have next. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank you, Jesus. In that mighty name I pray.